Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just learned some very interesting applications for the technology on this video. Never thought about that, but definitely interesting. So my name is Eric Matos, and I'm co-founder of Phytosynthetics. Uh, we make LED horticultural grow lights. So, and we are developing a plant-controlled lighting technology that is addressed to attend the problem of high energy consumption in indoor farms. So what is the big problem, the big picture that we are seeing today? According to the UN, by 2050, we're not gonna be able to produce the amount of food necessary to feed the world population. So population is increasing really fast, and our food production methods cannot keep up with that. With the technologies that we have today, we're just not gonna be able to feed the entire population on the next generation. <clears throat> to make it worse, the amount of land available for food production is not increasing. Actually, it's decreasing. If you have more people in the world, they need a place to live. You need development of the cities. So what we really need to do is to increase the food production per area. Now, this situation is pushing food production to indoor facilities. They're named Controlled Environmental Agriculture. And in these places, everything is adjusted for food production. So you can control the water, you can control the nutrients, the CO2, the temperature, the lights. And because of that, food production is much higher on these little places. We have the technology to do this. That's not the problem. The problem is, are they economically feasible? And in most cases, no, they are not yet. One of the main costs on these indoor farms is electricity that is used to power the lights. People don't realize, but plants use a lot of energy to grow. 30% of that is just going to lights. Here is a slide, that's a picture of our laboratory at the University of Georgia. And just to illustrate how inefficient the lighting systems are today. On your left side, it's an LED lighting system. An LED is the most efficient lighting today. On your right side, you have a traditional lighting system that most of the farmers use today. Pay attention on this picture now. That's an infrared picture of this growth chamber. What that shows to you is that on the left side with the LEDs, even though they are the most efficient technology today, they still generate a lot of heat. So about 80 to 70% of the energy that goes into this light fixture becomes heat. And you can see how orange, yellow it is on top of the LEDs. So they produce the heat on the back of the light. If you look on your right side, the traditional lighting system, besides generating the heat, on the, on the light fixtures itself, it's even worse because it emits a lot of infrared radiation into the plants. Can you see the plants like yellow, red? That's not good for the plants, they really don't like that. And then comes the another layer of complication is that plants can waste up to 80% of the energy that they absorb as heat. That's a protective mechanism. As everybody knows here, plants cannot move around, so in nature, they have to be able to adapt to a day that you have a lot of light in a day that is rainy, you don't have a lot of light. So they have these mechanisms to waste excess of energy when needed. Now, if we are growing food in indoor facilities, why not make our lights adjust to the plants instead of having the plants adjust into the lights? And that's exactly what phytosynthetics is doing. So we develop a lighting system that is being controlled by the plants. It's super cool, the lights are talking to the plants. We have a light sensor, uh, sorry, a plant sensor. This plant sensor is looking to the plants it's measuring fluorescence that is emitted by these plants. So the plant sensor is looking to the plants and is collecting all the signal. And based on the signal, we can tell how the plants are using the light. If the light is being used for photosynthesis, which is good, or if it's being wasted as heat, which is not good. So the sensor communicates with a control software. It's like the brain of the system. The control software gets this information, runs a bunch of calculation, and then sends a signal to the LED lights to change the light output to best match the plant's necessity. Important to say, we need to use LED lights because LEDs are the only technology that allow us to control them really fast the way we want. We control frequency and duty cycle. You cannot do this with any other kind of lighting system today. So here are a few of the, the good points of the technology. Lights are talking to the plants. It's a light, lighting optimization in real time, so it keeps monitoring in real time, constant. And based on the plant's photosynthetic needs, it always keeps the plants at the highest efficiency. And this is a patent technology. To illustrate how the technology works and all the benefits. 
So the same picture again on our lab. We did a side-by-side -side trial. So we grew plants on the left side using our biofeedback controlled LEDs, and on the right side, the traditional lighting systems available today for 10 days. Let's see what happened. This is a graphic showing how the lights and plates behavior on the non-controlled lights, the traditional lighting system. Yellow line, that's the light intensity. It's is the, X, is, uh, is, the, is the units on the right side. So then the lights are on all the time. They keep on throughout the day. And what happens is the blue light is the photosynthetic efficiency of the plant. So the plant goes up and down because they are just responding to the stimulus of the external light. And that's how every indoor farm behaviors should be, everywhere. You just turn the light on or off. Now, what happens with the biofeedback controlled light? So we now set the target for the plants, which is the blue line, the photosynthetic rate. We say, I want you to work at this certain rate. And then the plants are now controlling the light, which is the yellow line again. So you can see how the light is responding to the plant's needs. So the lights start at a low intensity at the beginning, and they keep increasing throughout the day as the plants need more and more. Take a look what happens if we compare side by side on this situation. Again, left side, no controlled lights. Right side, the biofeedback controlled lights. At the end of the growth trial, this amount of energy was saved by the biofeedback. Those are the numbers from these trials. We run these trials with two kinds of lettuce, so two different species, and they produce the same amount of biomass but the biofeedback uses 30% less energy. So going back to the question on whether or not these indoor farms are economically feasible, this can be a game changer. This can be the tipping point to decide whether this facility is economically feasible or not. If you take, you just shave 30% of energy consumption out of the, the expenses at the end of the day. So this is a very good number for the environment. We are growing the same amount of biomass using less energy. Now, if you are the grower, it gets even better because now you have an average of 40 to 45% increase on the grams of biomass per dollar that you spend in electricity. Real application, real case. We are now working with a partner, industry partner in North Carolina, and they are set up in their indoor farm and they talk to us to make their lighting systems. They wanna produce 180,000 heads of lettuce a month. That's gonna cost them uh, sorry, they're gonna use 250,000 kilowatts hour of energy per month, and that's gonna cost them $25,000 per month to run this facility at a 10 cents energy price. If they adapt the biofeedback, they're gonna be saving $90,000 per year. That's a lot of money if you're selling lettuce. Lettuce is a very cheap food. You can see this as 3.5 months of operation for free. You're gonna begin using the biofeedback. Or if you look to another angle, if you want to keep your energy consumption at the same, you would be producing 54,000 extra heads of lettuce a month. So very big numbers for the grower. Applications of this technology. We tested this technology with the four plants you can see on the slide, lettuce, sweet potato, petunia, and potos. These plants have completely different lighting requirements, and the biofeedback could just adapt to all of them. So this technology adapts to any kind of plant and can be applied in hydroponic greenhouses, vertical farms, container farms, which is a new training today, and in-home systems. And I like the in-home systems because now I can grow my vegetables at my garage and not at the garden where all the deers eat all my food before I had a chance to eat the food. So really, really helpful for me as well on a personal level. What is this market? In US, the vertical farm is our niche market. That's where we want to start. So it's just the indoor farms and the container farms. The market is rapidly growing. From 2013 to 14, the amount of money invested on the systems increased 60%, reaching $51 million. Now, if you look to the global market, now we're talking about LED grow lights in general for the four kinds of application. This market was estimated to be $400 million in 2013, and is projected to reach the mark of $2 billion in 2018. So there is a lot of applications out there and a good scenario for a company working with lights. Our team is composed by myself. Uh, I am the CTO of the company. So the company started as a spawn off my PhD dissertation at the University of Georgia. My co-founder, Ryan Hunt, he was a lab mate when we were in school. And the CEO, Ivan Kruglak, who is a 
electrical engineer, so he brings all the expertise to make the system work, all the electronics that I don't know, so it's a good combination. I bring the plant science, he brings the electrical part, and he's also a successful entrepreneur. He launched several companies in the past. Use of funds, what are you gonna do if we can get this money from, from the prize here for this $100,000? The main application for the money is getting our Frank Stang lab prototype, which works, it's just ugly, it's a bunch of wires, a lot of work to be done, and make this into a commercial product, of a nice prototype that we can take to growers, to investors, and really gain the traction that we need for the company. So here is the breakdown of the cost, I don't need to go into all of them, but it's basically how to get a prototype into a final product that I can show people. And here are the projections of our company for 2016. So if we can get this first prize, we're gonna be able to get something and leverage this 100,000 by getting $1.7 million in R&D and innovation. That would basically come $1 million for the biofeedback development, just keep increasing because there are several applications for this system. Uh, we would like to set up a lab in Athens, so help the community to grow, generate jobs, and we are seeking $700,000 from research grants. They are basically from the Georgia Research Alliance, the USDA, and NASA. And both uh, Georgia Research Alliance and USDA were looking for phase two. So the only reason I'm mentioning that is because we, I would like to say that we were able to get the phase ones. We've been completing all the goals successfully, so we believe we have a good chance to get the phase twos. And again, if we have a nice prototype and it can gain some traction, we expect to get our first contract with these folks in North Carolina. It's a $2 million contract, so we can really put our technology out there, start to prove the number and see the benefits, and then we are seeking another million dollars for commercial development, which would be other applications. So it's just standard lights to replace standard applications with food production. So, how is this technology impacting the world? Coming back to our first slide, where everything started, we have this problem that population is increasing faster than food production. If we can collaborate to reduce the costs of indoor farms and increase food production around the world, we expect to change this line and really increase the food production all around and make food available to everybody everywhere. Well, I think with that I conclude my presentation. I'll be happy to get some questions. Thank you. So um, there are other companies out there working on LED uh, technologies for plants. Does what you do overlay on top of uh, spectrum-based systems, uh, improving those on, uh, on top of them? And then when you deal with individual plants, you're dealing with multiple plant types. Do you need to tune the system to the plant, or is it automatically adjusted for any plant type? All right, so first question with the spectrum, you're right. There are 99.9% .9 of the other LED grow lights on the market. They are looking and optimizing light for plants looking at the spectrum. So uh, just for everybody to understand is you can get the specific wavelengths that the, the, the plants like better and produce and provide just them so you can reduce the cost. That's what everybody's doing. We are taking a different approach. We are looking of what the plants are doing with the light one time the light is absorbed. So for the first question, the technologies are complementary. We can just complement. We are not looking for that because everybody's looking uh, right now. So the first question was? Yeah, we're the, first oh, the, the second question, sorry. Uh, tuning. So if I have different plants. Oh yeah, sorry, I got yeah. it. For the, uh, tuning, for different plants. That's the beauty of the technology. The technology is based on a physiological aspect, which is, oh sorry. We're measuring fluorescence. On this slide, I knew this question. <laughs> so fluorescence is the, the red light. Every time you shine light into a plant, the plant re emit part of the light as fluorescence. So that happens at the chlorophyll. Every plant has chlorophyll. It's a physiological process that every plant has the same mechanisms. So the system, yes, can identify a different plant and quickly adapt. And so it is applied to any kind of plants. How about the differences in the nutrient value of the different plants as a result of this technology? Uh, again, so for nutrient value, touches again on the wavelength we're using. So using different light colors to induce different pet metabolic pathways. We are not looking for that, but it can be applied. One time, uh, we figure out which light colors induce any kind of nutrients. 
then you can quickly integrate with this technology. Just to conclude this question, for example, red lettuce, you can grow the lettuce under white spectrum, white light. If you expose these lettuce at the latest days of development to a certain different colors, they just change the color, which means some pigments are being produced there, which then touch to the nutritional value. That's not our goal. Our goal is to increase biomass, but can be integrated with this technology with no problems. And my second question is, is this being used for biofuels at all? Yeah, good question. Uh, my PhD was algae, so I was working with algae. So this whole lighting system was developed to increase the production of algae biomass on the biofuel program. What we quickly realize is that the market does not pay for the technology. It's really expensive to make biofuels from algae, so we just pivot. And it can be done, it's not cost effective. Hopefully we can get this technology to a down price that we can later apply back to algae. It could be, but not yet. Anyone else? Erico, thank you, great job. Thank you.